everyone. Happy Sunday. Uh, before I continue, probably I, I want to remind uh, everyone who is watching our live stream from YouTube, we are going to partake uh, the Holy Communion after the sermon. So if you guys can prepare your elements, uh, it will be great. So you can join with us with the uh, uh, Holy Communion. All right. So let me grab my table. Sorry, guys, I'm doing the housekeeping. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, t- today, Pastor Irwan cannot be with us because he has to be in Dallas, Texas. Not for eating barbecue, right? <laughs> but he has to be there because our brother and sister in IFGF Dallas, they are dedicating their new building, their new church building. So, guys, remember that we have a, a family in Dallas, so if you guys happen to be in Dallas, Texas, uh, you can stop by, you can connect with them. I'm happy to connect you with uh, some of them. They are good people and they have a good barbecue, I believe, right? So that's good. All right, so today, uh, this month, uh, October, we are going to go through the new series that we call uh, Living in Freedom. Uh, In the past two months, we have been in a series called Leading Inside Out. And last week, Brother Qingming reminded us that we need to be planted in the community, in a family that, or which is surrounded by God's people. Okay? And we are planted, meaning that we are called to grow. Right? The intention of somebody planting something is so that the things can grow. Correct? So, today we are going to uh, start our new series called Living in Freedom. And if you guys notice that when we started 2021, we have a, a bigger team called Greater Destiny and we are reading from the book of uh, uh, First and Second Peter, right? So we have been, I think for the, for the first six months, we have been going through reading, uh, listening, and then studying from the first uh, Peter. And I, right now we are in the last quarter of 2021. Okay, guys, and we hope that we can learn from uh, Second Peter, uh, the second letter of Peter. And when we are talking about Peter, everybody knows Peter, right? The Apostle Peter. We will easily relate to him. For me, Peter is the representative of a Christian in general. You know Peter. He's uh, outspoken. Sometimes he, he speaks before he thinks, right? just like us, or he speaks while he's thinking, okay? Or sometimes he speaks without thinking, right? Just like us, but he learned his lesson. Um, He was very courageous. He was offered confidence. Remember when Jesus mentioned uh, to him that he's going to deny him, deny Jesus three times, what he said, I don't know, that's not going to happen with me, right? So he's offered confidence, but he did it anyway. Okay, when he should have prayed, he slept. Remember in the garden? When, yeah, that, that Peter's, just like us, right? So when we are supposed to pray, we sleep, okay? But as Peter learned in his life, we can learn also from him, okay? And Jesus knows about Peter, even in Matthew 16, Uh, Jesus mentioned about that, hey, Peter, you are Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church. And then if you go through the same chapter, some verses after, Jesus rebuked him, and he said that, Satan, get behind me. You are stumbling rock. Can you see that that kind of uh, contradiction there? Oh, yes, you are rock. I will build my church there. But then when Jesus said that, you know what, I'm going to die, I will be captured. And then Peter say, Lord, that's not going to happen to you. And Jesus said that, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. Okay, so let's learn from uh, Apostle Peter. And uh, Peter wrote the first letter, first Peter. And when we read the first Peter, we can learn that Peter emphasized on the grace of God. Grace, grace, grace. Peter was well known about being legalism, even after his conversion, okay? But then on the first Peter, he put 
uh, his writing and then put emphasis on the grace of God. Now, when we read the second Peter, his focus shifted, not on the grace of God, but on the knowledge of God. So let's read uh, second Peter, chapter one, verse one, two, three. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Very nice way to introduce himself. A servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. He humbled himself because he is the servant of God, but he knows his identity. He knows his assignment from Jesus Christ that he is the apostle. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who call us by His own glory and goodness. So Peter opened his second letter with a description of a Christian life. A description of the true believers to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as a precious as ours. So I believe this is very important guys that you know your identity you know the truth to this word is very confusing the best the best way to identify the best way to to detect a falsehood in our world is by understanding the character the, the characteristics of tr truth so you know you have to know the truth otherwise we will be confused correct so the christian life begins with faith everybody agree peter said right faith and what is a a relationship with faith with 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 jesus so faith in the person of Jesus Christ, okay? And this faith also involves God's power. This faith also involves God's promises. So our Lord Jesus Christ can secure three things for us. Three things that we cannot buy, we cannot get it from anyone else. First is righteousness. Second is grace. Third is peace. You cannot buy righteousness from anywhere. You cannot get a grace from anyone. You cannot get peace from anyone else. So when we trust him as our Lord, Jesus Christ, his righteousness become our righteousness. Okay? So that we can have a right standing before God. And how did we get it? It's just by the grace of God alone. Grace of God is a God's favor to the undeserving. So we are the undeserving people, okay? We don't deserve those, but God gave it to us, okay? And what's the result of that grace is peace. We have a peace with God, yeah? And the nice things when, and, and Peter said, grace and peace be yours in abundance. It's a multiply, it's abundance. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So, do you, do you know that the word grace actually never mentioned in the book of Matthew and never mentioned in the book of Mark? Only mentioned three times in the book of John. That's from the gospel. Yeah? John chapter 1, uh, verse 14, 16, and 17. Let me read it for you. And the word the word become flesh and dwell among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Okay, verse 14, verse 16. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, the abundant grace. 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the word grace actually is, only mentioned three times in the book of John. Never mentioned in the book of Matthew, in the book of Mark. And people are starting trying to uh, comparing between truth and, and grace. Which one is more important, truth or grace? 
which one we can choose, truth or grace. But the word of God says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. So in one package, guys. It's a one thing, grace and truth. Truth is the way grace works. Okay? So you cannot choose either one. You cannot have either one. Jesus came full of grace and truth. Even the word truth uh, appears, I think, probably at least 55 times in the book of John itself. So it doesn't mean that grace is less important or truth is uh, more important or vice versa. No, no. Truth and grace is one because truth is the way grace works. Now let's read John chapter 8. Verse 31, 32. I, I think the, the worship leader mentioned about this. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen? The truth will set you free. And this verse has been quoted so many times, but only the verse 32, not the 31. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Yes, everybody likes freedom. Okay, even, in fact, we have a freedom to praise and to worship God in this place. But look at the verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So this is the, the step uh, towards uh, a progressive towards the a true discipleship in Jesus Christ. So first step is what? Believe in him. Believe in Jesus Christ. Remember, it's by grace alone. It's a gift through faith, right? That we believe in Jesus Christ. And the second step is what? The perseverance in obedience to scripture. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. So we have to know our identity that we are Jesus' disciple. And Jesus' disciple job is to obey his commandments, right? Because we are his disciple, we will then know the truth and the truth will set us free. Who's the truth? John 14 said that, Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one come to my father but by me. So the truth is not just surrounding facts about Jesus. When we know the truth, it's not just we know about Jesus or we know anything about Jesus, but when we know the truth, we know him personally. We know him personally. Just, you know, everybody like to to have their social media. Everybody, probably most of us uh, have uh, Instagram, right? So you guys like to follow people, correct? Probably your, your favorite celebrity, somebody that you know. And probably 99% you will know about that person. Okay? You know about their interests, their hobbies, probably their life. You can retell story about that person, about that person. But it doesn't mean that you know that person. You know about them, but you don't know them. Okay? But in our Christian life, we are called to know him personally. It's a personal relationship. One quote from J.I. Packer, one of our, my favorite uh, theologian. A little knowledge of God is worth more than a great deal of knowledge about him. A little knowledge of God is worth more than a great deal of knowledge about him. Uh, can you show that quote? So, we can, we can master all the scripture, guys. We can memorize it. We can, we can quote all the verses from Genesis 1 to Revelation. right? But if you don't have personal relationship with Jesus, it doesn't matter. The personal relationship with Jesus is the one who transforms our life. Okay? 
So I want to go back to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who call us by his own glory and goodness. So we learn that our uh, Christian life begins with faith. Okay, We have saving faith in the person of Jesus Christ. And when we know him personally, we also experience God's power, right? His divine power. And God's power produces life and godliness. So when we are born into the family of God, by faith in Christ, we are born complete. What does it mean complete? Because God has given us everything we need for what? Not for luxury, not for our enjoyment, but for a godly life through our knowledge of him who call us by his own glory and goodness. Sometimes when you, you buy a car, sometimes you got a, a recall. You know, recall? Oh, there's something wrong with your car. Can you go back to the dealer and then we will fix it for you, right? When we are talking about God's creation, God never recall his creation. He never recall us. I hope not, right? <laughs> so because we are, we are born in complete, in supernaturally, that we are complete. Complete meaning that we have everything that we need for a godly life. God, godliness. So God not only gave us that power, but also God gave us a promise through his word so that we can develop, we can, we can grow the life and godliness. So this promise is great promise because coming from our great God. Now, when we are talking about the journey in our Christian life, uh, I want to talk about uh, one of the very uh, common terminology in Christianity is called God's providence. So when you are talking about, when you are studying about the doctrine of God, you will learn about the God's providence. Again, the word providence is almost never found in the Bible, in the English transla uh, translated Bible. Okay, I think it appears only one in King James Version and New American Standard uh, Bible. And I think it's only one in the Old Testament in the New International Version. So the word providence is not found in the, in the most common translated uh, Bible. Just like the word Bible, right? So we will not find the word Bible in the Bible. Okay? You will not find the word like uh, well, Trinity, right? You will not find the word Trinity in the Bible. But the reality, Trinity, providence, is here. Okay? The, the concept is here. Yeah? Now, when we are talking about the, the, the doctrine of God, the God's providence, there's a one of the teaching in, in this world. It's called uh, deism. I believe it's called it deism. Deism say that God created this world and then he abandoned it. He abandoned it. So he created this world and then God will abandon that creation and let the creation just run it by himself. But God's providence, we can define like this, that God is continually involved with all created things such a way, in a such a way that he keeps them existing and maintaining the properties which we created them. Just like a raining today. Because God maintained that. No one can create rain. I mean, natural rain. Right? Second, God also cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do. When we say that God cooperates with us in anything, probably I will give an example just like a, like a selfish. Thing. That's why we do have a a, a, a missionary. We do have a mission works. Okay? Whether you believe in predestination or God's election kind of thing, still, that person needs to hear the gospel. Right? Still, they need to hear the gospels so that they can put their trust in Jesus Christ. We need a mission works. That's why we have a lot of missionaries. We have Scott here. Because why? Because God 
cooperate with this missionary in such a way to proclaim the gospel so that people can hear the, the gospel, Romans 10, so that they can have faith, right? They can put their faith in Jesus Christ. And God's providence also directs them to fulfill his purpose, God's purpose, not our purpose. So the providence of God is the working of God's sovereignty to continually uphold, guide, and care for his creation. And if we believe that God's sovereign, right, God's sovereign over everything, I think the, uh, the best example is, you know, when we are flipping the coin or rolling the dice, we call it that's a random chance, correct? Whether it's going to be number one, two, three, or coin, head, head or tail. But Proverbs 16.33 mentioned this one. The Lord is cast, like the coin, is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So God works in such a way that basically he governs everything in this creation. Now, I want to compare this God's providence with a miracle. You guys know miracle? Anyone has ever seen miracles in their life? Yeah? So, so miracle is when God suspends natural law. He intervenes the natural law to do something outside of the natural law. And without natural law itself, against natural, natural law itself, so like walking on the water, probably you are praying for the, for the sick, and then the sickness just gone, right? Without doctor intervention, that's, that's miracle because God suspends the natural law. Okay, that's miracle. God's providence is different. God does not necessarily suspend the natural law, but he works in a miraculous way, such a way that he holds them together, he put everything together, all the elements, all the subjects, all the actors, all their activities, blend them things together in a masterful, masterful way that he achieved his purpose. So, uh, Young mentioned that we have a, a good old friends here who used to be living in Seattle. Now they are in different state, right? Ryan, uh, Alan, or Kevin. That's, I believe, is a God's providence that you, a God works in your life in such a way that you've been here with us for, I don't know, two years, three years, four years, becoming a blessing to us, okay? Become our family, and now you are in a different place, in a different city. And I do believe that God has a specific appointment or assignment for you in that new place. You might be coming back to Seattle, I don't know. Right? But we believe that God's providence is working in such a way that everything pull together and hold them together to serve his purpose. Now, when we are talking about God's providence, we remember about God's name. In the Hebrew, God's the Hebrew, there's a one name that's called Jehovah Jireh. God, the provider. Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. This is the story when uh, Abraham was instructed by God to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Okay? And Actually, the Bible doesn't really tell uh, about the feeling of Abraham, right? When we read, Abraham just, okay, let's go. But we don't really know uh, his feeling. But Hebrew 11 says that Abraham know God's character. That's why Abraham is called a friend of God. He knows God's characters. He knows the characters of the truth. He knows that God's has a power to provide so that he put his trust in, in God. So provide in a Hebrew language also means to see it. Okay? The God who sees, God who provides. Uh, we sang the song, 
I think, I think a week ago, that saying, He is the Alpha and Omega. Okay, He is the God of presence, God of future, God of past. Okay, because God basically suffering the Alpha and Omega. He knows everything that's going to happen tomorrow. Okay, He will not forget what happened yesterday because He is God of yesterday too. Right? So when God asks Abraham to, hey, go to the mountains and of, uh, uh, sacrifice your, your only son, Isaac, he already knows what's going to happen. Yeah? But Abraham didn't know. Okay? But one thing that I learned is because Abraham know God's character, he put his trust in, in God. I don't know the feeling, but it's a very deep personal relationship between Abraham and God. Now, how can we apply this? I know uh, the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, has been impacting a lot of us. Okay, I lost my, my dad uh, earlier last year uh, when the COVID-19 uh, hit Indonesia in the beginning. I know some of the, some of you also had a, a losing losing a, a family member and stuff because of this one. And then the debate, the common debate is what? Like, a, is this COVID nineteen from God or not? Right? Did God create these things or not? There's always a debate. Some theologians say yes, God uh, uh, basically uh, created this one. Some theologians say that no, 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 God never created this kind of evil. Yeah. But I believe God has anything to do with it. When I say God, God has anything to do with it, is God allow this thing to happen? Because I believe even COVID-19, the pandemic, is still under God's control. So do not easily take God out of the equation. Oh, you know what? God doesn't have anything to do with this. If God doesn't have anything to do with this, whom should we pray to? Right? Even, even people who do not believe God blame God. Blame on God because of this COVID-19. Right? Oh, I don't believe God. When the COVID thing happened, then, God, you are so cruel. Where's God? Oh, I thought you don't believe in God. Well, I mean, God is gracious enough, right, to be <laughs> to be blame on everything that that we do, but I do believe that God's providence is over everything, over our season of life, everything that we have, everything that we are experiencing, still under God's control. Another, 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 another question. Usually, people ask, "What happened if?" Judas, Judas Iscariot, did not betray Jesus. Did Jesus will, I mean, will Jesus go, still go to the uh, uh, Golgotha and then die on the cross? What happened? Well, I do believe if Jesus, Judas didn't bet, betray Jesus, at least somebody else right, will betray, I don't know. But that's God's providence. God will work miraculously to work everything right even remember about joseph's story when joseph was sold to egypt and then he became the ruler i mean he went to prison he became to uh, to be the ruler of the the, the uh, uh, egypt and genesis 15 50 say that joseph said to the, his brother that you meant evil against me but god meant it for good actually when joseph Say that first. I believe he recite Romans eight twenty eight, right? <laughs> for those who love God, God work in all things together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. I want to say to all new students here. I know probably this is like the first time you, you are here in Seattle. Um, I just want to encourage all of you to see God's providence in your life daily. 
not only new students, for all of us, okay? But for all the new students, you know, it's not a random thing that you choose UW, SU, or Shoreline College, or Edmonds College, okay? God has worked miraculously in such a way to bless your parents so that they can afford you to be here in Seattle, okay? Again, you don't need, you don't need a miracle to, to, to get your degree, right? Oh, I don't know. I don't think you need a miracle to get a 4.0 GPA, right? <laughs> I mean, God suspend all the natural laws, make the professor blind, and then give a 4.0. No, right? God has provided you with a such a blessing so that you can be here. Not many people has that privilege. Now, remember your identity. You are students. Student coming from study. Your job is study, right, guys? <laughs> So you study, you get to know each other with your friends. You are here in the family of God, okay, so that you can talk to us, to talk to, to people who are working. You can learn from them, learn from their successes, learn from their failure, and then you will fulfill your destiny that God already given to you. So look at that. God's providence in, in our life in such a way that it's daily God provide, God provide, God provide. The same thing with our salvation. For me, my salvation is a miracle from our perspective because Jesus died and then raised from the dead. That's a miracle. That's against the natural law. But it's become a personal providence to me that God works in such a way I can receive Jesus Christ as my Lord. Everyone has their own journey with God, while our future destiny is the same, that we will reign with Jesus Christ. Our journey with Him might be different. God is interested not only in our destination, but also in the journey, because on that journey we can enjoy His providence in our life that has eternal value. If we believe that God suffering over, over everything, God suffering over the end, God suffering over the means as well. Regardless your background of your family, regardless uh, what you did in the past, you are here listening to this word, the truth, and the truth will set you free because we are the disciple of Jesus Christ. That's our true identity. Uh, I want to close with uh, one quote from John Piper. In God's providence, everything is significant. Everything is significant. Good things, bad things is significant. Everything is meaningful. Good thing, bad thing is meaningful. Nothing is random. Nothing is pointless. Nothing is meaningless. So today we are going to partake the Holy Communion. This is not a random thing. God has prepared this from the beginning. The moment Adam and Eve fall into sin, God has provided the way of salvation.